What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge em Up. It's time to nerd out with our latest remastered build and this creepy crawly Argonian is just as deadly as he is ugly. But before we get into the build, I'm very excited to announce that Fudge Muppet is starting Twitch. We're going to be Twitch streaming three to four times every week very soon and we actually did a test stream just earlier today and it was an absolute blast. It started off as a private thing but then you guys actually happened to find us and it turned into a pretty legit set. Session. If you love our Skyrim build and Let's Plays, then go follow us on there. We're going to be doing tons of Elder Scrolls, some Fallout, perhaps other games too, and all three Fudge Muppets will be there. Our sensational YouTube content will continue as normal, and if I must say so myself, I personally think our lore videos have been on fire recently. Very happy with the success on Fudge Muppet and the outpouring support from you guys. Again, Twitch link is in the description, so get excited because it's going to get massive. Now for the remastered Praying Mantis. Our old video for this build was just over three minutes only, and it hardly had a backstory. Now we've given it proper justice, with a deep backstory and enhanced roleplaying. We've also refined the perks and improved the skill set. The Praying Mantis hails from deep within the swamps of Black Marsh, and he fights with all the ferocity of a cold-blooded killer. The Mantis is not only the greatest warrior of his tribe, but was also hand-selected by the sentient histories to seek out Alduin and the dragons of Skyrim and to destroy them. They must be sent back to extinction before they can rain dragon fire down on Argonia and the sacred histories. With the will of the gods and the histories and two war axes resembling the razor sharp raptorial legs of the praying mantis, the common crooks of Skyrim will be fighting a hopeless battle against something from their worst nightmares. Don't forget that timestamps can be found in the description below to help you find your way throughout the video. But with that said, let's get right into the praying mantis's race, standing stone and stats. The mantis this is an Argonian of Black Marsh, not an insect, and his Hist skin ability grants him the ability to invoke the power of the Hist to recover health 10 times faster for 60 seconds once a day. This practically makes him invincible while that's happening. He also has a 50% resistance to disease and the ability to breathe underwater. As an Argonian, he has certain skill boosts, one notable one being a boost of plus 5 to alteration, which we're using. In the early game, use the Lover Standing Stone for leveling purposes, but then switch out to the Atronarch Standing Stone for that 50% spell absorption, making mages considerably less daunting in fights, and also weakening Dragon Breath. As for his stat spread, put 50% into health and 50% into Magicka until alteration costs are reduced enough through enchanting, and then you can start dumping all of your stat points into health. You have an Absorb Stamina enchantment on your axe, which will keep you covered for stamina, so don't worry about investing anything here. You'll be able to do all the dual power attacks that you want. The Praying Mantis hatched on the shore of a great gurgling swamp, deep in the heart of Black Marsh. His egg, along with hundreds of others, rested half-submerged in the ruddy green water, and there was warmth there bubbling to the surface, and it was believed to make the hatched Argonians of his tribe stronger of mind and sharp of claw. The people of his tribe had watched on bated breath, anticipating the first crack in the Praying Mantis' egg. He was the biggest egg laid in their tribe for generations, and as far as they were concerned, that was an omen, signifying the birth of a great warrior. The Praying Mantis grew up in this small settlement deep in Argonia, surrounded by enormous trees and warm bogs. Life was everywhere. Tiny insects with spindly legs dashed across the surface of the swamps. Dragonflies of a thousand colors hovered over the vast marshes. And of course, there were the histories, sentient beings who the Argonians revered and felt a very strong connection to. His elders taught him much about the hist, and as a result, the Mantis felt drawn to these histories. He could always catch the scent of their alluring sap from a league away. The Praying Mantis also loved that his home was relatively quiet and not too crowded. One elder in particular, Okan Kerr, who was so old that he had spent all of his waking hours submerged in the swamps in order to move his limbs, claimed he had been to Hellstrom, the city at the heart of Black Marsh, but according to him that was a week-long hike to the south. In his secluded settlement, the Praying Mantis was free from distraction. On most days he learned language and theology from the elders near the biggest hist in their village, and then trained with weapons in the soggy marsh for the rest of the day. It was important to know how to defend yourself and also to develop the mentality of a warrior. Due to his large size and genetic proficiency in battle, his elders gave him special treatment and spent extra time improving his skills. The Mantis favored the axe, one in each hand. This was not seen too often in his tribe, however his elders were happy for him to adopt this fighting style as he could demonstrate it with great coordination while still retaining power in each deadly swipe. 
The sun rarely showed itself in full. It was usually masked by a thick layer of grey-green fog in the middle of Black Marsh, but the Argonians had keen enough eyes to know its location in the sky, and when the sun was setting, the Mantis would put away his axes and make his way to his favourite swamp in the settlement. There he would enjoy the weightlessness of his body being suspended by water, and he could finally let his muscles relax. Often the praying mantis would end up deep in personal thought while relaxing after a long day of studying and training. Sometimes he felt his skills were wasted in isolation, where his tribe would probably never be troubled with attackers. He was such a large and powerful Argonian, but for the most part he was content, enjoying his daily routine. Things continued in a predictable fashion for years, until he knew most of what the elders could teach, and he was clearly the best warrior in his generation. So when the tribe's next warrior ascension ceremony, which is what his tribe called it, came along, the praying mantis knew he would be chosen. With little left to learn from the mortals of his tribe, the ceremony was his best chance at enlightenment, or at least to increase his wisdom and power. In the warrior ascension ceremony, the worthiest warrior of the tribe would be sent into the glowing moat of hist sap surrounding the largest hiss tree in the settlement. And there he would need to drink the sap until his stomach could drink no more. Usually Argonian shamans and mystics would do no more than lick hissed sap once or twice in hopes of receiving a vision, but drinking the sap in such a high quantity almost guaranteed some sort of vision, maybe a visit from a ghost-like apparition, or a loud voice reverberating in your head. Either way, the praying mantis would soon find out, as he was chosen for the ceremony. The elders hummed their tunes under the night sky, and the only source of light came from the bright amp a hissed sap. The way the thick fluid flowed was hypnotizing, and the orange glow danced on the hiss tree's trunk and the ground around the sap. The mantis knelt beside the pool and carefully dipped his hands in. The substance was slick and sticky like honey, and his mouth watered as he breathed in the sweet, earthy aroma. He cupped his hands and poured the sap into his mouth, drinking deep and allowing the smooth nectar to fill his stomach. When the humming ceased and the ceremony ended, the elders carried the mantis to a nook in the hiss tree's roots where he was left to sleep and that night his dreams were vivid, and they were as real as anything he'd ever experienced. At first everything was black, but then a roar echoed in the caverns of his mind. The sound of a bonfire burning could be heard faintly, far away in the back of his head, and then he realized as it drew closer that it was no bonfire. His dream wasn't black, it was just a starless night, and from high in the sky, fire rained down on him. Suddenly he was among hundreds of others, men and mer, creatures he'd never seen in his life, were all around him as real as family. They were screaming in agony and running for their lives from the torrent of fire which poured down on them. Some of the men and elves were burning alive, turning to ash as quickly as firewood. Those who didn't burn to death had fled, and soon it was just the mantis, staring into the darkness above, waiting for the next bout of flame. In the distance he could see a tall mountain, and out from behind its snowy peak he saw a dragon, a black dragon. Alduin, a voice in his head cried, the world eater has come for all of us. The voice was wooden as if its vocal cords were made of oak and its saliva made of sap. The history, the praying mantis realized. The voice told him of the return of the age of dragons. They would soon dawn in Skyrim and then they would burn Tamriel to cinders, eventually turning on the histories and the Argonians too. You must save Black Marsh, the voice persisted. Only you. Go north to Skyrim. The mantis awoke with a choke. His stomach was distended, swollen from the sheer amount of sap he'd consumed, but the voice resonated in his head, reminding him of his task. The mantis announced his visions to the elders and they blessed him, giving him their favor and the favor of the Hist for his journey. And then the praying mantis headed north. The Hist would protect him, and in protecting him, they would protect his people. If they failed him, they would fail themselves. Hence the mantis was full of courage and reassured of his safety as he ventured into unknown territory, and all seemed to go as planned until he was caught crossing the border to Skyrim and was carted off to face the judgment of the gods he didn't know. The praying mantis endured the disdainful, disgusted looks of the humans who put him on trial in stoic silence. He refused to fear them and trusted the histories to protect him, even this far from their dominion. And when he felt the stone cold of the block on his neck, the hist spoke, and the very creature he'd been tasked to kill emerged to save his hide. It was all too perfect, and after this moment, the praying mantis will be 
be resolute and sold 100% on his vision. He will hunt the dragons of Skyrim with his war axes and will use their powers against them. Discovering that he is dragonborn will be his next blessing as he is granted more power than ever before to carry out his mission. Despite the hostility he receives from the foreign men and Mur, the Mantis will harbor no ill will against them. He knows that he is in their home so they can judge him how they please and he doesn't even expect them to be thankful when he saves their homeland. He's not a crazed killer and is more focused on his profound goal but if he is forced to protect himself he will and with no mercy. He's not going to allow some meddling bandits to jeopardize his duty. As for factions he will of course follow the main storyline continuing this into the Dragonborn DLC. He will join the College of Winterhold to enhance his magical abilities and he will also do the Dawnguard DLC. Siding with the Dawnguard is more fitting to his character but there is a lot of really cool potential for his character as a vampire. He is already considered alien to the people of Skyrim and despite being there to save the province people will undoubtedly fear him at first sight, so adding vampire fangs and eyes which glow as bright as hist sap would be fantastic for the aesthetic. That said, if you do choose that path, I'm gonna have to let you rationalize the role playing. The Companions Guild's also an option, but once again, while the Werewolf Curse would be cool, it may be a bit irresponsible for the savior of Skyrim and the hist to acquire a power he might struggle to control. Now that we know the Praying Mantis's backstory, role playing, and faction choices, here's how it all translates into his skills, spells, perks, and playstyle. Skills for this build will be one-handed, alteration, heavy armor, smithing, and enchanting. There are many crucial perks to talk about, but first be sure to grab the Paralyze spell and the Detect Life spell. You can also use flesh spells like Ebony Flesh to boost your armor rating. This will give you added tankiness as well as a good way to train your alteration skill. But with the spells cleared up, here are the essential perks to take for the Praying Mantis. The Mantis spent years ankle deep in the marshes of Argonia, honing his skill with dual war axes and with nothing to distract him from his training, few mortals fight with the ferocity and skill of the Praying Mantis. From the one-handed skill tree, take the middle branch up to Savage Strike and Critical Charge, then take the right-hand branch in its entirety. Dual Flurry and Dual Savagery are massive. As you'll be dual wielding, quick and strong dual wielded power attacks will be your bread and butter. Dual Flurry will make these attacks 35% faster, and Dual Savagery will make them 50% more powerful. The Praying Mantis is no stranger to the mystical forces at play in Tamriel. In his settlement, divine trees watched over his kin and gave him visions of ancient and powerful magic. The Mantis would be a fool to neglect the potency of magic, and as a result, he uses alteration flesh spells to augment his fighting style. He can strengthen his tough skin even further and can paralyze his foes entirely, making them defenseless when he closes in with his sickeningly sharp axes. From the alteration skill tree, go for the middle branch up to expert alteration. Along the way, grab magic resistance, stability, and atronarch. With atronarch, you'll have an additional 30% chance to absorb all of the magicka of any spell that hits you. This will take your spell absorption to a total of 80%. With magic resistance, you can block 30% of all incoming spells effects. With the the alteration skill tree you'll be dealing with mages no problem and you'll be using paralyze and detect life as much as you wish. The Mantis doesn't rely solely on his thick alteration enhanced skin to protect himself against his enemies. In Skyrim, the home of the Nord Warriors, the steel is sharp and the smiths are skilled so to combat that the Praying Mantis uses heavy Falmer armor. From the heavy armor skill tree get everything except for matching sets and reflect blows. Tower of Strength will give you 50% less stagger when attacked in heavy armor and a conditioning will stop heavy armor from weighing you down. So you may be wearing heavy gear, but your sheer speed and strength will make you an unstoppable force. As I said, the Nords make great blacksmiths and the Praying Mantis is savvy enough not to rely on inferior equipment when taking on the mammoth task of saving the world from dragon fire. Therefore, he will learn to smith weapons and armor like the best of the Nords. From the smithing skill tree, take the left branch up to advanced armors and then get arcane blacksmith. And lastly, we have a skill which goes hand in hand with all of this, especially smithing, to make the most powerful armor arms and armor imaginable. From the enchanting skill tree, go for the middle branch up to and including extra effect. The play style is pretty simple. Often you'll just burst into battle, dual wield power attacking and almost always killing your enemies in one attack. You can use detect life before combat starts to plan out your attack and find out where people are and then the paralyzed spell will keep any unruly foes under control, making it easy to dish out a killing blow. Other times you can go for a more hunter-esque insect-like approach, paralyzing your enemies and then walking over to their immobilized bodies, ripping them to shreds one by one. As for gear, you'll want a set of fully smithed up Falmer heavy armor, but instead of the headpiece, use the shellbug helmet. Top this 
face off with a necklace and ring of your choice. Put Fortify Alteration and Fortify One-Handed on every slot possible. That way your alteration cost will be nothing in the end game and you'll do a ton of damage with your axes. As for everything else, you can put on whatever enchantments you want. I'd suggest stat buffs that suit your personal take on the playstyle. For weapons, grab two fully smithed up Thalma War Axes and dual wield those bad boys. Enchant one with Soul Trap and Paralyze, then put Absorb Health and Absorb Stamina on the other one. That should cover both the offensive and the defensive side of things every time you perform a dual wielded power attack. Make sure you have the Black Star from Azura's Quest too. That means your Soul Trap effect can be used to constantly refill the charges on your axes and you'll never have to worry about running out of charge. And there you have it guys. Subscribe to Fudge Muppet for more builds like this and give the video a like if you enjoyed it. As always, timestamps are in the description below with links to all of our social media accounts and also our newly announced Twitch. Give us a follow on Twitch and Twitter for some high quality Elder Scrolls and Fallout content, shit posts, and the occasional bit of useful information. Thanks so much for watching guys. As always, my name is Michael and I look forward to nerding out with you all again very soon.